Hello everyone, welcome to the YouTube channel. This is going to be an episode me talking about the Australian Open that has recently concluded a little bit of um, my thoughts about modern tennis, relating it back to the old days and who are, are the greatest players of all time. Now before we get into all of that juicy discussion, now I just want to again raise awareness for bushfire really, uh, relief. Uh, it's been quite difficult in Australia for a lot of people, uh, the intense heat waves and the winds and all the wildlife and humans getting affected in this with houses b uh, burning down, people nowhere to live, it's been absolutely disastrous, uh, it's been awful for a lot of Australians out there, so I've, I don't think this <laughs> or any of my videos will of course um, reach enough to really <laughs> make an impact for that, but I maybe every little small bit counts if I could just raise a little bit of awareness for that um, it's out there you know uh, it's, it's, it's an awful thing and uh, just wanted to spread a little bit of awareness by raising it to people who may not know they've been living under a rock but yeah enough of that um, let's talk about the tennis um, it's been quite interesting so Djokovic did win in five sets a little bit of a controversial win because he did introduce a few stoppages when he was a variety of times in the match especially when he was behind now this is something that a lot of tennis players do do so they can sort of regroup um, it, was it actually indicative of Djokovic's performance did he deserve that timeout was something actually affecting him I don't think we can make a valid argument on that for either way, we don't necessarily know. Um, Djokovic has done this in the past when he has been behind, where it doesn't look like he's injured at all, but maybe in this scenario um, he looked a little bit sick, perhaps. But yeah, uh, we don't really have some conclusive evidence in result to that, so I can't really make my full comment or analysis on that particular thing. But either way, um, props to Dominic. He really did give it to uh, Novak and the whole match there, having to take this man to a fifth set and probably his strongest slam um, I believe it's at, at the eight Australian Open titles to his to his belt Novak Djokovic was an insane stat <coughs> correct me if I'm wrong there guys and um, if you're able to take him to five sets you know especially at one of his grandest slams then you are truly a talented player and it is a very good sign for up and coming talent um, which is something I wanted to talk about for a little bit in this video to up and coming talent and I feel like this is um, a topic that some people don't ignore but they don't really talk about too much is um, I'm gonna give this a label this is brackets label I'm gonna call this uh, sort of philosophy the distribution of attributes now what does this distribution of attributes mean? So basically, each player in tennis has a variety of different traits. They have a set of different attributes. They have strengths and weaknesses, um, you know, in relation to their speed, their power, their stamina, their forehand, their backhand, their serve. Now, in modern day tennis, the coaching philosophy for the most part is to make sure that everything is very well rounded so you don't have weaknesses to exploit in your game. Now, as underst as I can understand that, especially with uh, players that are talented in the first place that can really stretch this uh, beyond imagination and create like a very solid game. You look at all the greats in the past and sure, you could say that tennis will evolve but we haven't exactly seen that yet. All of the greats in the past usually have an attribute that really stands out that personifies them as a player so we look at for example I guess Pete Sampras would be a very good one um, one of the very few players in history of tennis to have a lightning second serve and of course you can like nobody else on tour basically did that or has ever done that on a consistent level as Pete Sampras which is completely bonkers he has a unique part of his game that nobody else will practice against, therefore giving him a more a better advantage in Grand Slams. And especially if you're um, you know, a lower seed and you end up going against Sampras, 
uh, in the first round or whatever, it's going to be extremely difficult. This is why these guys rarely got uh, upset, right? Because you can't really prepare for these types of guys because of how unique they are. Um, we'll look at the opposite end, uh, end of that in Agassi. This guy um, had an absolutely wicked return. Um, I'm sure we've had great returners in the past, but this guy was the very pioneer of baseline tennis, and he was pretty good, at one of the very best at breaking serves. So he had that specific attribute. So we're looking at the service attribute for Sampras and the counter um, return attribute for Agassi. These are two defining traits that both of these players have that made them difficult to prepare for because of how strong they were in those sectors. Now, if you want to cycle back to, or cycle forward, I should say, to the modern tennis era, you look at players like Rafael and Nadal. Now, there's a slight little asterisk towards these players because they are getting older and I don't believe they are at peak performance, but we'll look at Rafael Nadal and Roger Federer. Now, Rafael Nadal was probably one of the most unique tennis players who has ever graced the sport, in that he has a very strange, or strange, or abnormal um, te- uh, forehand motion in his in his game, right? He just spins it up like this, sort of looking like a lasso when he hits the forehand, to generate as much top spin as possible because of how much like whip he has in the ball and that's why a lot of players especially who are shorter struggle against Rafa because the ball just spins up so high I believe he was he had the second highest spin on tour uh, last year now the reason why this is so unique is because nobody really has that much spin in their game and practicing against someone who plays like Rafa Nadal is, is a very very difficult because this guy plays such a different style of tennis he isn't exactly the run run it down every single ball like he was back then with Rafa and just sort of loop and then saying the point he's evolved that game to make sure he's a little bit more aggressive but still he has these looping high shots that are so difficult to get a solid hit on and he forces you to play shots that are at an immediate disadvantage when it's in your court because of how the ball spins it is such a unique way to play the game. Um, the way that he's manipulating the ball in terms of its height, in terms of the way it goes and curves towards the side, especially, you know, it's very difficult to pass Rafa, especially on the forehand side, because he, uh, one of his favorite shots, or one that he's famous for, would be the banana shot, where if he's getting the ball towards the outside of the court on his forehand, he has the ability to spin it around the net. That's how much spin this guy has on the ball with a sort of whiplash forehand motion. And it can magically sort of curve like that and then spin towards back inside the court where the line is. Like, it's amazing how much spin this guy generates on the ball. You can look at Roger Federer in terms of being someone who is one of a kind, really. He is a sort of modernization of what the old style of tennis was. So (coughs) the reason why this is so unique is because a lot of the young players that are coming up or sort of during that era wouldn't have sort of gone against someone like this guy because, you know, Agassi and Sampras were on their way out. And Federer was one of the last standing to sort of reinforce that old style back then because he had elements of the net and the service uh, sort of game part of him. Now, back then, he would sort of do a lot more slices to try and neutralize the point, run around, go for his forehand. He still does that, but he tends to approach the backhand a little bit earlier now to try and neutralize a lot of the spin that today's ball has. But still, he is so well uh, acclimated with both modern and past tennis styles. It's amazing how they're both sort of fused together. So um, with those both sort of conjoined, he's created some... A very unique style known as the Roger Federer style. He can mix you up any way he wants. He has every shot in the book. He's not, he is the definition of an all rounder technically. And when I was sort of criticizing how that is a sort of coaching philosophy nowadays, no, but Roger Federer is a different type of all rounder because he 
is implementing past philosophies into the game as well. A lot of these all-rounders now are just uh, sort of accelerating the modern way of tennis. This guy has old elements within his kit that he brings forward into modern tennis too because of how old he is and how he can sort of bring back his old uh, tricks from going against players who played that way back then, you know? So he generates a style that this pretty much dead because of you know the the age on tour and the restrictions or not i shouldn't say restrictions it's sort of like on, on the body at that sort of age you know and i guess my last example is going to be novak now novak is probably an evolution of, of sort of agassi um it's a hybrid of agassi and, and, and a modernized version of that now what makes novak so good um is he has a sort of fallback style that is always reliable. I mean, his elements that where you're supposed to be at a disadvantage are actually pretty in favor of Novak. This guy had the most successful breakpoint conversion last year, and he also managed to make his second serve and first serve a lot stronger, especially at today's Australian Open. And this is a guy who had the most consistent second serve pretty much on tour for a very very long time that's the reason why you can't really get many free points from Novak is because when you're supposed to be at a disadvantage this guy still manages to get these second serves in with a decent amount of kick to make sure you're still uh, at a disadvantage at that point you're still on your back foot despite you know second serve being a situation where if you're returning that's when you can finally get an advantage where it's supposed to be the service advantage with a higher percentage I believe like 70s and ups like especially in these high pressure moments and the other sort of um, part of his game as well would be his returning so two of these factors where it's difficult to recover from where the other person is supposed to be on the front foot Novak actually performs very well in those situations when he returns and he second serve these are elements in a in a tennis game that are you know especially with players that have low caliber they will struggle against to win against the better players because they'll just be taken advantage of this is a reason why we don't see so many uh, breaks against Novak and he's so consistent whenever he plays so all that taken into context, all of these modernized players who are in the big three have elements of modern tennis. Sure, that is correct. But they also have past elements that are extended upon and they make sure that they're exaggerated to the point where it's difficult to practice against them and you can only meet them in a tournament to do so, right? These guys are just fantastic at what they do, and they just exceed expectations every time they play. Now, one of the difference between, of course, these types of players would always be, <coughs> pardon me, would always be the mental game, as well. I mean, we can't discount that fact. That's always going to be the biggest uh, discrepancy between the top players and the guys who are on the up. It's going to be about you know performing the best when the points are on the line when you're just trying to get that break point, which will lead you back into the set, when you're surfing it out for the match. These are very important statistics to take count. And this is something that actually recently Roger Federer has had a very a difficult problem with. But these getting these points where it matters is also something that you need to take into consideration as well. I mean, that's always going to be something uh, that the young players will have uh, problems with because, of course, you need that experience at these higher pressure levels to really you know, get used to these type of things, right? But overall, I feel like we do have talented up-and-coming players. I mean, Theum, uh, Dominic's fantastic. He has a one-handed backhand, which I love. It was probably the most beautiful shot in the sport. Um, he was up against the uh, Zverev in the semi-final, which was a good match. Zverev def definitely has some potential. Um, I think Dominic has more potential in my opinion but Zverev just seems one of the good things about Zverev is he runs down the ball despite being so very tall and lanky and he does contest a lot of these points but he doesn't in my opinion have the X factor he's just a solid guy I, I feel like He'd be always in the top 10, but I don't feel like he'd be winning slams consistently. You know, he could probably win. He, he's going to be the Andy Mario of the modern era. Let me just put it that way. 
Pardon me. But Dominic does have a sort of X factor attached to him. I feel like if he can win these uh, modern points more often. Oh, I have my computer turned off there. <laughs> Apologies for that. I didn't touch the mouse. Um, so my monitor turned off. I feel like if he can win these points more um, consistently and if he can do a lot more unforced, uh, not do a lot more unforced errors, I'm going to sound French there for a second, then he would be a Grand Slam contender. He's really good on clay court as well, so I think once Rafa um, is retired, then I think he's one of his best o opens or Grand Slams, I should say, would be the French Open. He could definitely snag a few there. But yeah, there's so many pet, uh, players that have had a bunch of potential and they've just sort of uh, laid down like a sack of bricks, you know. Uh, sack of bricks? Sack of shit. Okay, well, yeah, no PG stuff here. Especially with injuries, you don't know if you know any of these guys are going to be injured and we've seen so many players change because of injuries. I think Monfils would have been a dominant Grand Slam winner if he didn't have so many injuries. This guy, of course, he's incredibly entertaining. Um, but he is uh, a guy who plays in pain, definitely. And he had so much potential back then and was getting so many wins against top guys, but then he had injuries plaguing his whole career. Um, if these modern tennis guys don't have those sort of problems and they just evolve their game, especially like the likes of Kyrgios, I think Kyrgios has an X factor as well, but his mental game isn't there, unfortunately. If they can just consistently grind at this, then we might see a different version of tennis in the next five or ten years, you know? I think we definitely will. We don't know how uh, bowls, we don't know how courts, we don't know how the rules perhaps would even change, rackets. So many different sort of aspects can change in a lot of these years. I mean, don't forget, back in tennis, ages ago, they used to use wooden rackets, right? Something that people who play tennis now could never even imagine to do right that'd be so difficult um which sort of leads me on to a point actually now just sort of we'll finish off the point about the technology in tennis I, there's no way to predict that but it could definitely evolve in the future it definitely will evolve but in terms of evaluating who the greatest of all time is and this is why i'm sort of leading off the technology point it's very difficult to do that because when people relate to a lot of the, especially early guys who won a crap ton of slams like World Laver, people don't realize that, especially back then when Laver was playing, uh, there were only, there was only one surface, there was only grass courts. Now, the beauty of today's modern tennis era is, is all Grand Slams are different surfaces besides the US Open and uh, Aussie Open are both hard. So you have grass, Wimbledon. US hard, Australian hard, and the clay is for French. That's right, Roland Garros. <laughs> so you have to adapt to all those different styles of play. You know, famously, Wimbledon is going to be a faster surface, grass, the ball's going to be sli uh, slicing a lot lower. Um, a lot of the big servers are going to be stronger at grass tournaments. People who want to cut the point uh, a little bit shorter. People who want to extend the points, people who want to utilize the spin and slide across. Mobile players will have their way in Roland Garros, and hard courts are sort of mixed between the both, I, I, I feel. But hard court generally is a little bit uh, slow itself, too, especially uh, recently with Australian Open, what the players have been saying. It's very difficult to evaluate player levels and strength. If players back then, uh, when I'm talking in relation to Rod Laver's era, when people explained to him to me that well, he's the greatest of all time, they only had to play on grass court, which means that level of uh, adaption wasn't there. I mean, just imagine, you know, if, if Rafael Nadal was born in that era, and instead, you know, in some parallel universe, every tournament was clay. That would have been crazy. He wouldn't have lost a slam. That's crazy to think, right? Just imagine, I mean, even in the modern era, if every single tournament was clay, he would be on the top. You could probably make the same argument for Roger Federer, too. I don't think it's ever a fair assumption uh, to say that these guys, are the old guys, are the greatest. Of course, when the court started evolving and different slams had different surfaces, maybe you could make a debate. But even then, a lot of the players at, outside of the top 10 or even top 5 weren't as competitive back then 
and the level of skill was sort of distributed between the top two guys. I mean, you can make that same debate for the modern tennis era, but you still have people who are extremely talented outside of it. Um, but they just don't have the sort of mental game to fortify the top three. So, I mean, there are a lot of things that you have to consider. It's not exactly going to be um, the most record-breaking numbers for Grand Slams earned because you have guys who are, compete in this sort of tr triangle within Rafa, Novak, and Federer. They all have slams shared between them. It's not going to be like Serena, it's not going to be like Lever where they're going to be the only dominant ones. I mean, Serena, she's been injured quite a few times, so if she didn't get injured, she'd have 40 Grand Slams. We all know that. Um, where, you know, they only had like one, one or two people to contest with, especially they've had so many good sort of players on the fringe that have upset our pros in the top three. You can look at Stanislav Varinka at the Australian Open. He's performed great there several times. You can look at uh, Del Potro in the US Open when he defeated uh, Federer for his uh, first Grand Slam. We have fringe players that get those upsets, uh, but they didn't really happen as much back then. Uh, Saffin was probably even considered top tier back then, so I wouldn't even call that an upset. So yeah, there's a lot of things to talk about in that, act in, in that aspect, but overall, I think, I think tennis is in a good place. If coaches can start reinforcing strengths instead of uh, working around these weaknesses all of the time, just make sure that they have a, a good foundation, sure, but if they can create these guys into products that are unique versions of themselves, then I feel like we have a lot of room for them to develop into the players that they want to be. So yeah, that's all I really wanted to say. Congratulations to Novak Djokovic for winning the Australian Open against Dominic Thiem. Once again, uh, raising awareness to the bushfire relief. Hope everyone is okay. Take care, everyone. See ya. Goodbye.